So uh, welcome everyone to our third colloquium of the Center for Global Ethics and Politics uh, for this semester. We have one more to go. I think that's on November 16th, and that will be very interesting with the Immokalee Workers Coalition on worker-driven social responsibility, which is an interesting and important new concept. Uh, but today I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome uh, Professor Barbara Prainsack, who is a professor and head of department at, uh, at the University of Vienna in the Department of Political Science, I think, where she also directs this very innovative Center for, on Solidarity, Center for the Study of Contemporary Solidarity. And she also is um, the director of an interdisciplinary research platform on governance of digital practices. So she's published a really a large number of books, including some that we didn't list on our short bio. Uh, she's been um, one of the very most important theorists of solidarity in the context of bioethics and biomedicine. And so she has a book, Solidarity in Biomedicine and Beyond. Um, and that one was with Alina Boix. How do you say her name? Alina <laughs> so. Okay, Luke's. And uh, also published um, a book on personalized medicine. And uh, most recently, two books, one on, per uh, well, yeah, that personalized medicine, the subtitle, Empowered Patients in the 21st Century, and also the pandemic within policy making for a better world. That's the one that I understand is a manifesto, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm really delighted that we have such a, a leading theorist of solidarity, which is uh, a concept that has come to the fore uh, in recent years, although of course it has much older roots and many different possible interpretations. So I'm very interested to see how um, Barbara works out her own uh, interpretation, uh, which is a very uh, useful version of the concept, in my view, very practically applicable. So we're delighted to welcome uh, Barbara today, whose title is speaking on the theme, Why Justice is Not Enough, what solidarity can tell us about good data governance. Um, I, yeah, unfortunately we couldn't bring the leaders of Facebook and Twitter and so forth to hear this talk, although they ought to, but uh, they would disregard it anyway. So uh, <laughs> please, um, I, I wanna welcome Barbara for her presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A. So thank you for coming, Barbara, and welcome everyone. Thank you very much um, for the kind introduction and thank you for everyone who has um, who's taking the time uh, to join us. Thank you very much, Professor Gould, Carol, for inviting me and for your very generous introduction. So for me, it's a, a big honor to um, speak in, in a series convened um, by you because um, You've been, as you know, you've been very, very influential for our own work on solidarity, starting with um, the, um, the report on solidarity that we did for the Nuffield Council on Bioethics back in 2011. I will say a few words on that later on. Um, but yeah, you, you continue to be an inspiration for us and um, for our students when we teach and for the sake of full disclosure, I should say that <laughs> you're also a member of our advisory board of the Center for the Study of Contemporary Solidarity. So as Carol mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, what solidarity can really add to, to considerations of justice. And I'm going to use the example of data governance. I should preface my talk by saying that I think justice has something to add, so, sorry, solidarity has something to add to conversations about justice far beyond data governance. But I'm going to use this example and I'm also going to use this example because it is a field where my colleagues and I have been quite active in trying to not only diagnose problems, but also um, suggest solutions. Um, not saying that these solutions are perfect, but um, we've, we're trying to, to think of how we um, get to better data governance. 
Um, I, I'm, I'll ask and invite everyone to please interrupt me um, if anything requires further specification while I'm speaking or if you strongly disagree with anything and would like to say that before I continue. So now comes the moment of truth where I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. So you should be seeing the screen now. Um, I'm going to start with clarifying our own understanding of solidarity. Um, as, as Carol already mentioned, it's a it's, it's, we're certainly standing on the shoulders of many, you know, decades and one could even say centuries of uh, scholars working on solidarity. And, but we, we developed a specific sort of working definition on solidarity that we think is helpful in um, separating solidarity, distinguishing it from other pro-social notions, um, but also hopefully to give indications to policy and guidance to policy. Then I will also say something about what I believe solidarity can do for data governance and what the problem in data governance is in the first place that solidarity can speak to. I will then um, give an overview of our work on, on data governance. Um, I will call it the three pillars of solidarity-based data governance. Then go into this um, relationship between solidarity and justice on the occasion of data governance, although I think, I hope that some of those um, considerations will pertain to solidarity and justice more broadly. And I will conclude with some more or less preliminary conclusions, because this is very much work in progress also um, on uh, what uh, justice can learn from solidarity more broadly. So what is solidarity? Um, in the context of a report that my colleague Alina Buchs and I did for the Nuffield Council on Bioethics, which is uh, the most important bioethics committee within the United Kingdom, um, so they commissioned me at the time to carry out this, uh, this work and it was then published with the then assistant director of the Nuffield Council, Alena Books, in 2011. We did a, a review, a structured review of works published in English um, on, on, on solidarity because in those days, uh, in 2011, it was after the financial crisis after the avian flu and other epidemics that threatened to become a pandemic. It was the view of the Nuffield Council's leadership that solidarity was becoming more important as a concept, yet it was sort of underdetermined and we didn't really know um, much about the uses of these terms in the bioethical literature and beyond. We also looked at some um, social and political theory um, related to issues that bioethicists were concerned with. And we found a very diverse use of the term solidarity. Um, we found instances where, you know, diametrically opposed goals were justified with the same notion of solidarity. But we found two things that almost all conceptualizations had in common. And that is that there's some kind of support involved. You know, solidarity is a pro-social notion, at least uh, what is called in-group solidarity. Of course, every inside has an outside. Um, this is what, what Carol's work also speaks to. Um, but among the group of people that are in, enacting solidarity, it's something pro-social. It's, it's something good. Um, so colleagues have called it standing up beside, for, and with someone. Um, Jennings and Dawson, but it's it's a pro-social notion. It's a, it it involves support. Um, very often, in almost all of the conceptualizations of solidarity, um, again here a very influ influential work by Carol, um, link the notion of solidarity with substantive values such as justice. And many many authors talk about solidarity being um, 
something that helps justice to be realized. Um, Habermas called it the other side of justice. So there's some link between solidarity and justice that actually I will go into in more depth today. But virtually all conceptualizations of solidarity have that. It's also seen as something that goes beyond the interaction between individuals. So solidarity has something to do with the social fabric, institutions. It's a way, as Daryl Gunson called it, a way of organizing social institutions. So it's something beyond um, one individual supporting another, although it has that dimension as well, or that level as well. Um, and very often, almost always, it is also solidarity is seen as something that keeps society together. As something that is pro-social, not only within a particular group, but also within a society. And I think it, um, it's fair to say that, that the way in which solidarity does this is under-theorized. There's some very good works on this, but overall it's under-theorized. I think we've also seen that now in the context of the COVID pandemic where solidarity was almost constantly alluded to and very often um, people felt that those demands of solidarity or illusions and appeals to solidarity weren't actually followed up by, by actions of very often on the side of those who appealed to them such as vaccine equity, global vaccine equity. But coming back to our own conceptualization of solidarity, which is of course not reinventing the wheel, but trying to bring together these elements that I've now outlined, we um, define solidarity as practices, and that is actually some very important element in the definition, practices that reflect a commitment to accept costs, costs are not necessarily financial costs, but any kind of costs to assist others with whom people recognize some kind of similarity or commonality in a relevant respect. So that's a very wordy definition, <laughs> um, but every word has to be there. I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you why I think that is the case. First, um, I'm very, I feel very strongly that the most fruitful way to conceptualize and think about solidarity is actually as a practice. It is something that requires some outer expression. It is not merely an inner sentiment um, that it's not merely sympathy or empathy or something that people feel, but it requires grounding in a specific situation and it, it requires some observable um, action. Um, whatever this action is, it can be something very small and it can be something very big. So what does this similarity in a relevant respect mean? I think this requires some clarification also in the sense that we are, we're not intending to um, refer to uh, any nativist characteristics, features of groups of people that are sort of objectively there or that other people could recognize. It requires, so the similarity in a relevant respect takes place along categories that people have been socialized and people have learned to, to, to use to classify people. So to give you an example, if somebody has grown up in a society where they were told that people of a different faith, a different um, um, ethnic uh, affiliation or different looks are the other, they might find it very much more difficult to see similarities across groups of people than, um, than a person who grew up in a context where she was taught and learned to see the things that all human beings have in common or even all living entities have in common. So the similarity in a relevant respect is something that people see in others, something of themselves that they see in others. It could be something small and fleeting, but it could also be something large, such as um, a shared human vulnerability that is actually the similarity in a relevant respect that is the basis for publicly funded healthcare systems in continental Europe where I'm based. Um, and the similarity in a relevant respect is the key, is the, is the core of what 
I think sets solidarity apart from other pro-social practices, namely that in solidarity, the thing that gives rise to action is in the moment of practice, some symmetry between people that are acting. So this does not mean that there are no differences between people that we should you know, neglect or that we could neglect um, inequalities and different in unequal and inequitable distributions of resources and power. Um, it doesn't mean that, but it means that in the moment that I enact solidarity with others, despite the differences between us, I see something of myself in that other person, living being, and, and I support them. That, that, that's what we mean by that. It also means that if, if we consider solidarity as a practice, um, it, at least in our conceptualization, comes with um, a particular way of conceptualizing human beings, which is a very relational one, um, owing to um, Stolger and Mackenzie um, and other theorists, lots of uh, feminist theorists, of course, who have emphasized for many decades that human beings are autonomous, not despite our relations to others, but because of them. So in that sense, persons are inseparable from their social relations. And by social relations, I do not mean only relations to human beings, but actually relations and connections to um, our humans, um, natural and uh, even artifactual environments. Um, the last thing I would like to say about the conceptualization of solidarity is that solidarity is not merely recipro uh, reciprocity. So I, I added this qualification because very often I was asked, I'm at this point of my talk, you know, you know Solidarity is then just sort of mutual assistance. I do something for you, you do something for me. And as long as that kind of mutual uh, reciprocity, this level of reciprocity is intact, um, the solidaristic system works. Well, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that for solidarity to be stable, it requires some level of reciprocity, but not necessarily linear reciprocity. Uh, let's take the example of a um, healthcare system, of a publicly funded healthcare system that includes everyone, as an example. Um, I might, um, actually, I went to the eye doctor today. Um, uh, so I took out something from the solidaristic healthcare system today. Um, and it might be, I think not in my case, but it could be something that is much bigger than my contribution but I might take out something very big or give something very big tomorrow. Um, or my, a family member of mine might require something. So reciprocity is more to be understood as the feeling of people or the knowledge of people that they will receive support when they need it. It's not a tit for tat um, exchange. Uh, a, a purely um, interactional, understanding of solidarity, I think it's not, it, it's a business contract or another type of contract rather than um, solidarity. So solidarity doesn't preclude um, self-concerning feelings, needs, considerations, but if that is the prime motivation, it's probably something else. However, it's important to say, and this is my last point on this busy slide, others will be less busy, um, that a relational and the practice epistemology driven understanding of solidarity does not separate in a, in a dichotomous way between self um, regarding and other regarding um, elements of our practice. So it's, it's this older saying that uh, my, my relationships to others make me as much as I make those relationships. So to, to, to say that if somebody enacts solidarity with someone else, um, it's also good for them and thus it's self-serving. I think this is, this is just missing the point of solidarity. So um, to finish the uh, introduction into our own understanding of solidarity, we, we um, 
believe that solidarity often takes place on different tiers at different levels where the lowest level is uh, what we call interpersonal solidarity. So it's really one person enacting solidarity with someone else um, when this practice becomes so normal at the level of groups that um, it becomes regular group practice, it's group level solidarity. And when, solid when, when legal contractual norms, bureaucratic norms um, are developed in the spirit of solidarity, we have what we call institutional solidarity um, at, the, at the third highest tier. They are clearly related, those different tiers, but not in a, in a sense that every tier two has to be preceded by tier one and every tier three has to be preceded by tier two. But overall, one could say that tier three solidarity, institutionalized solidarity is more stable when it, when it corresponds with actual practice of people. So classical example to stick with the uh, example of publicly funded healthcare systems, when, when people still have to pay their mandatory contributions to a public healthcare system, but they no longer believe that the system is fair. They believe that people are free riding and so on and so on. Or they believe that the system is no longer effective, then uh, it will, the law that requires people to do this will be under, will, will be um, under challenge um, much more than if, if, if the law corresponded with actual practices. So what, what does a solidarity-based approach offer? It's non-dualist in the sense that it does not pitch individual interests against public interests. It's not communitarian in the political philosophy sense in that it places um, the public good above um, the, the needs and rights of individuals. It, it does not do that, but it tries to break open the, the break up the unproductive dichotomy between the individual and everyone else. It, it opens our eyes for the ways in which these can be aligned. And, and, and of course, this doesn't mean that there, are, that there will never be an attention, that there aren't exploitative relationships on the contrary, but there are many ways in which we can think about policy and other aspects where we see that we can actually support personal and collective um, needs, privacy is an example. So infringing individual privacy has a cost to society. It comes at the cost of trust. It makes for a colder society where people feel they have to protect themselves because institutions do not protect them. So here is a classical example, I think, where individual and collective interests are aligned. Um, it also enacts relational autonomy. Um, it foregrounds what people have in common, not what sets them apart. It also draws our attention to relationships and meaning. And, and this is uh, where, um, where many of our critics say that our conceptualization of solidarity is quite thin. And in a way, I agree, because for our, our, in our definition, solidarity is first and foremost something that describes a way of people, a dynamic of people supporting each other. But it doesn't say much about the ends that this support serves. So a terrorist group, if they have in-group solidarity, um, our definition of solidarity would consider that solidarity as well. So this is why we need reference to, um, to other substantive values that in a way give solidarity life, um, such as justice, which I will get to talk about very, very soon. But of course, um, we do say, and also in our works, that we have clear commitments to certain values, such as justice very prominently, um, that help solidarity um, take a particular form and shape. And, but we do also say that solidarity where uh, societies where we have um, 
high levels of societal solidarity. So not only solidarity within particular particularistic groups, but the high level of, of solidarity across society are commonly happier societies. And by happier, I mean um, that many of the, the, the outcomes, the measurable outcomes, um, uh, life expectancy, happiness indices, and those kinds of things that um, that the spirit level talks about, uh, that that solidaristic societies perform better in this regard. An important caveat is that um, solidarity has been used and is being used uh, from uh, con some conservative by some conservative um, um, actors, political actors, to actually justify a retreat of public responsibility. Um, from uh, providing um, basic services to people, for example. So, so one could use solidarity to say, you know, people um, should really support each other in providing um, social cares and, 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 and there's no collective public responsibility to do that. So the second part, what can solidarity do for data governance? And here, I think the, the, the first point is to highlight what the challenge is that solidarity can help with, I think. And that is the challenge of increasing asymmetries. So we've called that, that um, situation the I Leviathan. Um, I've discussed with many colleagues who've told me that this is a bad comparison because there are many features of the initial Hobbesian Leviathan that um, large tech corporations don't have. So I would not claim that that's, that's a clean comparison that is helpful in, 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 in every way to think about data, but I think it is helpful in, in, in some limited but important ways, namely that as with the Hobbesian Leviathan, where people submit their natural freedoms to, to receive something back, um, the large quasi-monopolists have become an, uh, kind of I Leviathan in the sense that people submit freedoms to, to receive something else back. Comfort, the, the ability to uh, communicate um, across borders and time zones and so on. And there's an increasing asymmetry, which a lot of people have written about um, between, uh, and borrowing a, um, an expression from Jerry Kang and colleagues here, big brother and company man on the one hand and um, citizens on the other. And this is something that the categories within which data governance works um, does not is, is, is not placed to effectively address. So another example, of course, is for, for the Isle of Ayrton is that um, some, some tech companies are now um, not only owning uh, the data, um, owning the software solutions that are used to curate the data, to store the data, um, the servers where the data, data are stored, but they're even providing health insurance in some cases. So, and, and setting research agendas by providing funding through philanthropic activities. So there's really an enclosure from, from, from many sides that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. And when I say that, um, I'm referring to empirical, um, empirical evidence for that. Unfortunately, this, this discomfort with um, the um, overarching power with some corporate players also takes the form of um, of, um, uh, of, of polarization against vaccinations and so on. So, but, but this, there's one big complex um, that relates to increasing power symmetries between corporate actors on the one hand and people on the other. But coming back to the issue of data governance, approaches so far have mostly focused on strengthening individual control. Very, very good example for that is the European, um, the, the European Union's Euro General Data Protection Regulation, which is 
I believe, I'd love to hear what you think. I believe it's actually a very good um, law overall, but it's, 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 it's um, goal really is to increase the control that an individual has over her own data and over the use of her own data. Um, an equally wonderful approach by my colleague Jane Kay in Oxford, um, which I think is fantastic in many ways, I mean, many, many for many types of practice in medical research and beyond is dynamic consent. So the idea that people do not only say yes or no when they consent to data use, but they have uh, the a possibility to uh, consent dynamically to um, dynamically in time and also different to different um, scenarios of, of the data use. So I'm not here to dis the um, general data protection regulation or dynamic consent, but I'd like to just highlight that these solutions leave a few things unaddressed. So there's a long list of issues um, that, that, that the focus on individual rights cannot really address. Um, alert fatigue when it comes to consent. Um, so we all know that if we ask 25 times to consent to the terms and terms and conditions, we will just click yes if we want to use uh, certain uh, features and the platforms. Not everyone is able to exercise control. You know these arguments. Shifts responsibilities to individuals. I think that is actually a very important concern. I believe that the 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 exclusive, almost exclusive focus on individual control over data has, has individualized the relationship between data users and data, sorry, data subjects and data users, and in a way been an impediment for collective action around data ownership. And I don't mean data ownership in a legal sense of property rights, but also kind of moral claim to ownership in, in the Ostromian sense, you know, something that we own together as a, as a joint resource. Yeah, it conceals power, symmetries, and so on. So there, there come some issues that with all its strengths, the focus on individual control has not addressed. So this is why increasingly, um, the scholars believe that we also need to strengthen collective control. The different approaches to data as labor approach is one, data trusts insofar as they're not just, um, uh, you know, data saves that individuals can lock their data to monetize at the individual level. There are those data trust ideas as well, but other data trust approaches that really conceive of data as data commons, they are also a way to increase collective control. And then solidarity-based data governance, which we focus on, but the other ones are clearly um, as important as, as solidarity one. So what are the elements of the data-based governance approach so far? So I will go through this relatively briefly because that that work has been published and anyone if anyone is interested in that you could um, read read more on this um, the first pillar is that we are trying to help create ways for data use that has public value i'll say more about that in a second to be to become easier so we believe that the fact that that a, a tech company can do almost anything with data because people have technically consented, whereas a university hospital cannot, is, is an asymmetry that we also need to address. And the answer cannot, cannot consist of saying, yeah, you know, anything goes, just use anyone's data, but we need to think of good ways that protect individual privacy and also um, data security at the societal level while focusing on public value. What is public value? Um, this is a, a definition that is not perfect uh, by any means. We, we are work, this is a work in progress, um, but uh, this is our definition so far. We, we believe that data use as public value when it can be assumed 
the data used will have clear benefits for either many people, for society as a whole, or for future generations. And so that's cumulative and no person or group will experience significant and undue harm. So these are public public uses of data that help for that that support um, disease research um, data that tries to make uh, to, they, tries to improve services for um, social services or marginalized services for marginalized groups and so on. But it has to be it has to be argued on, an, on a case by case basis. I'm not saying that a whole range of data uses should just be accepted as serving a public benefit. The second pillar of our approach is what we call harm mitigation. So from a solidaristic point of view, it is of, I talked about reciprocity before. I believe it is of utmost importance to, to accept that even the most beneficial data use for society might incur harms for people. These harms might not be financial, they might be emotional harms. Mary Ebeling has written a wonderful book, about, wonderful in the sense of, of brilliant, but also very sad book about, about this. Um, what kinds of harms can, can emerge from data use? And our argument here is that a solidarity-based approach needs to accept responsibility at the collective level for those harms. So this is why, you know, I've, I've said that we try to think of practical instruments and practical institutions. We proposed the um, implementation of what we call harm mitigation bodies. They are not, um, they are not a legal instrument. They're really subsidiary to, um, a le for, to legal redress. And they have, people can appeal to if they have, uh, if they, they believe they've been, um, they have experienced harm as as the uh, as a result of data use and these harm mitigation bodies have several functions um, they would also serve as some kind of nodal point where that collects data on what types of harms occur in the first place which is something that we do not know we do not understand informational harms very well but again, if uh, anyone is interested in that, that, that work has been published. And the last one is the least developed. Um, don't take the word tax too literally. Um, we're not sure about tax, but we feel that some, some of the profits that have been accrued um, on the basis of data use, in or acknowledging the fact that any kind of data curation has benefited from publicly funded infrastructure from the unpaid sometimes paid but often unpaid labor of uh, patients citizens and others needs to ensure that part of those profits come back to the public domain and this is not done um, sufficiently to date and we, we, we believe, or I believe, this is uh, something that, that I've been working on partly uh, with my colleague Marilijn Lansing in, in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, i show you Marilijn in a moment. Um, one of the things that struck us is that a lot of debates about data justice um, would benefit from learning from solidarity. So what do I mean by that? So data justice and the, the, the increasing literature on data justice is of course hugely important. I just picked one example by um, Lynette Taylor, who uh, summarizes um, data justice as fairness in the way people are made visible, represented and treated as a result of the production of digital data. So the data justice movement's great, um, one of the great strengths of the data justice movement, um, besides making visible and attending to inequities and try finding ways to address them, is also that they do not take the political economy for granted. So part of the data 
ethics work takes takes the distribution of power and agency and resources for granted and just tries to make processes more ethical. The data justice movement is one that asks bigger questions. I'm, I'm generalizing here, but I, um, I think overall, I hope it's fair what I'm, how I'm, I'm summarizing this. If you disagree, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Um, but there's something that is missing in data justice work. And I'm trying to get to the bottom of what it is that it's missing. So from now on, I'm going to talk about unpublished work that is very much work in progress. So I'm very grateful for uh, your comments, uh, as critical as they may be. So overall, what are the differences between solidarity and justice? I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that a lot of the um, conceptualizations of solidarity um, refer to justice as one substantive notion that is very, very important in connection with solidarity. Um, as a substantive value that solidarity is empty without, as a substantive value that solidarity should take as its goal, as the other, or as, as something that is required to realize justice. But there's always this, um, almost always this hierarchical relationship with justice, justice as the um, higher level role and solidarity as the practice that helps to make it happen. So what are the differences? Three of the differences that I think are important is that justice can be demanded. Solidarity can only, only ever be an appeal to. You cannot demand from someone that they recognize some similarity with others. Um, the second is that justice requires the consistent application of rules and solidarity does not. Solidarity does, you know, you cannot blame someone for enacting solidarity with one person or entity and not with another, because the voluntary nature of solidarity means that in a way. And also, although the conceptualizations of justice that are very relational and practice focused, there's always, justice is, Justice has this, justice is the subject of debates and deliberations of it, about its substantive content in a way that solidarity is not. And that has to do with, I think, solidarity being really an action term, a practice, first and foremost. I think, whereas much of the literature conceptualizes this as a weakness of solidarity, it could also be a strength. Because solidarity, understood as a practice, means that or expresses people's acting upon injustices, oppression, other things, before their ability to articulate it, or before they have articulated it. So solidarity is not the application of rules of justice that somebody has in her mind before she does it. Solidarity is often what people do as humans when they see some wrong, something, some, some, some uh, wrong to be done to someone else, some injustice experienced by someone else. And this is just a, as a nod to the side. Uh, we draw upon um, the work of uh, Noam Cook and Henrik Wagner in the fantastic article, Navigating the internally Unfolding Present towards an epistemology of practice where they really also try to break open the, um, the dualistic idea that knowing precedes acting. But they emphasize that action and practice always has epistemic content. So it's not that they say that acting is um, subordinate to uh, knowing, but it's really intermeshed. And this is what, what, what we look at. So I'm coming to the end. Um, together with my uh, great colleague, Marie-Elaine Lansing, and drawing upon data that comes out of a project that we've been running since, since um, March 2020. By we, I mean colleagues in 10 European countries. Um, it's called um, Soltan, <laughs> Solidarity in Times of Pandemics. We've uh, done interviews in 10 European countries with um, 
citizens, residents um, of those countries since um, March 2020 on how they are coping with the pandemic. Um, we cover almost every aspect of life um, in those interviews. Uh, a couple of papers have come out. You can find all of them on the website if you're interested. But I want to highlight one topic that we've covered in our interviews, which is contact tracing apps. I've chosen this because this is a data governance issue. So, and I, I think I would like to highlight this at the end of my talk to show you what I think justice can learn from solidarity. So we looked at um, a, a total of, I believe, 400 and something interviews for the contact tracing apps. Excuse me, I can't, yeah. Um, and you can find the reference below. This is the paper that, 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 that I'm drawing upon now. Um, conversations with, a, with uh, around 400 people about many things and among other things, uh, contact tracing apps. So as you know, contact tracing apps are the apps that people were supposed to carry with them and um, that uh, uses Bluetooth to highlight when somebody had a, had a problematic contact with someone who might have, um, uh, who might have tested positive or might be COVID positive. So what we find is that the practices of not using the app and the practice of using the app is all the literature outside, outside of our project says it's about privacy concerns. Well, yes and no. So when we actually look at what people do and say, it's about too much surveillance. It's about too much power for governments. It's about structural inequalities. People who say that I don't want the government to have so much power to know where, where we all moving around, where we go to, where we work. What about people um, who are in the country illegally? So even the ones who use contact tracing apps, many of them don't actually like it so much, but they say they do it because they have to protect their health and the health of others. So privacy is really a collective concern first and foremost. Um, so the, the, the reasons that make people use the apps or not use the apps, the, the motivations that shapes practice in this regard is very much a concern about what kind of society do we want to live in, not how do I protect my own data. And this is really across all the countries we looked at. We have no data from the US, unfortunately. I'd be very surprised, however, if it was really drastically different. So the, the implications are, and I would like to end with this, that um, we, when we take this seriously, that we can learn from solidarity for justice in data governance and beyond. We can also formulate policy questions on the basis of practice. What do people act upon? What are the concerns that drive that? Uh, is everyone else having the experience of a frozen Barbara? Yes. Yes. So, uh, what do we do about that? Uh, I'll try chatting. Oh. She might uh, just have to log back in. She may have oh. to go out and back in. Okay. Um, hmm. Oop. Yeah, she's not even in. That's the problem. Um, I don't have her cell phone. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. I don't see her as in at all, right? Um, okay. That would be a shame if we lose her completely. Mm. 
move. Hang in there, folks. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, I'm not oh, that that's a relief. I was just trying to figure out how to reach you. I was about to send an email, which is very slow and old technology here. I'm, I'm back. I'm back with my phone data because my Wi-Fi has caught. Anyhow, I was at the end. Oh my I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we got all those great uh, references um, in uh, recorded, so uh, at least we didn't miss miss that. Um, okay. Hopefully, your data will uh, <laughs> uh, survive. Um, Never a dull moment. Anyway, uh, so please, um, people, uh, feel free to ask some questions. I have a bunch, but I will wait my turn and defer to uh, people. Try to use the raise hand function or just wave at me so I can know if you'd like to ask a question. Um, okay, let's start with Virginia. I see, I see a hand. Um, Barbara, can you hear us and everything? Yeah, you can unmute yourself because you'll be. You, can you hear me? Yes, Virginia, we can hear okay. you. Great. Um, it seems to me that more needs to be said about the relativity of solidarity, because in the case of a hate group uh, or a fascist political movement, we would want there to be more individual resistance and less solidarity. Um, and so what does this say about solidarity as a value? It doesn't seem to be um, a value um, in quite a few cases. And maybe um, Barbara could address that. Thank you very much. So you are referring to in-group solidarity of, of groups right. that have problem, yeah. So, I believe that solidarity, as, as I try to explain, um, is pro-social in the sense that it supports those that, um, that, that others see as similar to themselves. And that, that it cannot be taken for granted that this will work across um, across groups, particularly in a political climate where political leaders pitch different groups of people against each other, sometimes around um, nativist categories. Um, my honest answer is I don't, that I don't think that solidarity alone, without reference to other substantive values, can overcome this. Um, I believe it requires the it requires these other substantive values such as justice and equity um, to realize this. This is certainly um, something that could be held against our definition. I'm sticking to this because I feel that if if solidarity becomes more or less the same as justice, the same as equity it loses its analytic power, it, 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 lose, it loses its strength to explain why people or how people actually support each other. But yeah, um, I understand if this is not a satisfactory answer but, um, for those of us who want solidarity to be um, an emancipatory term in, in itself. The last thing I will say though, is that when, when we look at solidaristic practice empirically, then it seems that many of those practices emerge around injustices and oppression, um, trying to address and remedy these. Um, okay, Hugo and then uh, Svenja. Thank you for using the raised hand, but we'll go with Hugo. Uh, Virginia, did you want to come back first? I'm no, no, sorry. that's okay. That's All right, the... okay. Hugo. I, don't, I don't have that much of a question, although it could lead to a question, but you, you uh, discussed harm mitigation strategies. And I just want to point out that there are uh, thoughts about harm mitigation in many, many other areas right now, not only data use, but in medicine and uh, in particular social medicine. And so uh, it, I, I would encourage you to 
I know a bunch of um, medical professionals who have taken this on as almost a new uh, guiding force because uh, the, sometimes the harm, and that's the issue with a lot of the COVID pandemic um, uh, vaccinations is that the long-term harm mitigation, uh, long-term de deficits are uh, highlighted sometimes in a risk balance um, uh, formula uh, upon which people can really differ. And so there's a large body of harm mitigation, how it applies to data and data usage in part has got a medical history to it. And so I would encourage you to, if you haven't already, look in some of those other disciplines for uh, concepts of um, how they have developed their thoughts to date. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll take, I have done this in some, in some niches of also medical practice, um, but I will definitely take this point on board and, and do a much more systematic review of what's going on currently. Sure. So thank um, you very much. In almost any area you'll see, uh, should there be um, uh, safe houses for injecting drugs for drug addicts, for example. I mean, uh, anywhere you look, there'll be this sort of debate as to harm mitigation and the dangers of encouraging what might be called bad behavior. And so this amplification of, uh, of um, uh, practices through solidarity or through collective action uh, can very often have a, a dangerous side associated with it. And there's debates about what those dangers might be. And it's a well-discussed concept, in, 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 certainly in social medicine, so. Okay, so, but now I feel that I should respond more substantially. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, yeah, yes, but most of the harm mitigation, uh, harm mitigation measures that, that are currently debated to my knowledge are actually around practices that as such are undesirable. Like done desirable by some, such as um, substance abuse, such as um, other practices that that have moved from that that were actually moralized and criminalized at some point that are mm -hmm. now that are now in thankfully in a discourse where we try not to blame people engaging with it, but where we try to take some kind of social responsibility for data use. However, this is very different because data use does not suffer from the problem that is seen as an undesirable practice. On the contrary, it is infused with hyperbolic um, exaggerations of its value to the extent that data is seen as the new oil and you know this rhetoric. So to sure. say that we need harm mitigation for something that is marketed as a great solution for almost yeah, all of the world's problem yeah. is different, I think. Yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Svenja is next. Thank you very much for the talk and for your work on solidarity in general. Um, my question refers to the three levels of solidarity and maybe that comes in two parts. Like I understand the second level. I wonder about the first and the third. And the first, maybe it has something to do with my understanding of the term of practice. I know practice from the discourse in German critical theory, the work of Rahel Jaige, for example. And there, a practice already always is something social. And as such, I can only understand it in a group because it's a, an established pattern of action that is interpreted, uh, that is loaded with social meaning. And if that's the practice term you have, then it doesn't seem to make sense that an individual can actually act in solidarity without such a practice being established in a group. So maybe maybe you just use practice differently. I, I just don't understand how the individual can, how can the individual expect reciprocity, right? Like if, if there's no, nothing to refer to. And on the institutional level, you, you made a remark today that we can't demand solidarity, that it always has to be given willingly. But is that not something that you lose as soon as it is institutionalized? So, so I wonder, do you really think solidarity, it's the same concept on all of these three levels, or is it something different that is only vaguely connected? 
Thank you very much, Sonia. These are fantastic questions. Uh, difficult. Um, the second, I know I start with the first. So I do not use a radically different version from Yahel Yagi, for example, Rachel Yagi, for example. Um, of course, practice is also in our understanding, um, which is actually mostly derived from uh, from um, Noam Cook and Hendrik Wachner's work. It is social. Um, but where the social aspect comes in, in our conceptualization, is mostly to shape the meaning that this practice has for us. So, for example, if somebody is doesn't see um, people who are overweight, to use to use this as an actor's term, um, as someone who is like themselves, then this is very much also a socially shaped category that has a lot to do with the um, invention of body mass indices and so on and so on. So the, the very notions that we use to other others are of course socially shaped, but it doesn't prevent, I think, some doesn't prevent us to say that drawing upon those social categories, one person, could enact solidarity with someone else, um, who they consider, again, drawing upon these social meanings as similar to them in some way. Um, I don't think it needs to be embedded in a kind of group practice, the solidaristic practice itself. In terms of the meaning that it has, it is always also a, a product of collective doing and meaning, absolutely. So the second, question about um, um, institutionalized solidarity. Um, you are absolutely right that it is a different type of solidarity and it contradicts what Jody Dean and others have argued, many others, that solidarity can only ever be appealed to. However, with institutionalized justice, what can be demanded is technically not the solidarity, but the, but the enforcement or compliance with a legally binding or contract yeah, with a contractual norm that was developed in the spirit of solidarity. So institutionalized solidarity is in that sense really at a different level. Um, also here you cannot demand solidarity and a very good example is a progressive tech, income tax system where you and I might participate thinking, wonderful, I, I want to participate in a progressive income tax system because it's socially more just than others, whereas other people just participate because they don't want to be fined, right? So not everyone who is part of institutionalized solidarity does actually meet the requirements of level one or two solidarity. So in that sense, it's different. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Shant? <clears throat> Shant. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you. I thought that the talk was really fascinating and it, and it ties into exactly what uh, my classmates and I are discussing in, in Carol's class. So because I'm also very intrigued about the idea of institutionalizing solidarity, and I'm wondering if you could say more about the extent to which that can be accomplished. Um, you know, in the, in the example about data, um, it seems to me that there's, that lends itself to an opposition between, you know, people with an interest in, in solidarity and um, large corporations and governments that that control our data and like the corporation and government in and of themselves are large institutions. It doesn't seem, I mean, if someone wants to take a solidarity minded approach to data, maybe with the exception of things like the harm reduction body and some other entities here and there, there, there aren't many institutions to which people can take recourse. So, I mean, is there a guiding principle for determining, you know, how much solidarity can be institutionalized, if that. I think there is an enchant. Um, I think that the institutionalization of solidarity is as much a matter of political will as it is of pressure from the people. Um, when we look at instances of institutionalized solidarity, then the, you know the, the paradigmatic examples 
are the ones that I already mentioned. They are universal healthcare systems or progressive taxation um, or um, risk sharing arrangements that, that, that have been institutionalized. Cooperatives actually and commons are sometimes forms of institutionalized solidarity. They're not institutionalized in legally binding norms in some cases, but they are institutionalized. So it requires the, the pressure from the people who want that and requires legal instruments and policy solutions to enable that. So for example, law, when we talk about data, laws that support commons, the, 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 the institutionalization of commons, they would be a facilitator um, that, that remove some of the um, very onerous requirements that cooperatives have to meet in order to be a registered cooperative. So those kinds of things could facilitate that. But I don't think that there is, you know, I'll think about this more, but I don't think that there is a kind of general answer of how, of, of a mechanism um, to do that. I don't know what you think, wh whether you think there is one. No, I mean, I think um, the, I mean, not only, I mean, the, the pandemic related data is a new issue, but I mean, for years and years, we've seen tons of problems with uh, management of data by social media companies and, and other entities. Um, and I'm, I just, I find the idea of countering that with some sort of solidarity incredibly appealing because I mean, the, the corporations and governments that are declining to effectively regulate them are just so much more powerful than individual users, customers, what have you. Um, but given how powerful they are, it'd be nice to somehow visualize <laughs> a way to, I guess, give solidarity teeth is what I'm thinking of. I mean, um, I can see how it wouldn't be conducive to like a rule of thumb for institutionalization. I mean, maybe institutionalization. I was, I, because I think of corporations and, and governments as institutions, I sort of the idea of solidarity kind of lent itself to me to thinking in the same terms, but maybe that's not right. Maybe that's not the most effective way to think of, you know, this question, how do you give solidarity teeth? Maybe it's not through the approach of institutionalizing it, but, but something else, which I, and I don't know what that would be. I think so. I mean, I think and it's the last thing I say because uh, there's also at least one more colleague who wants to say something. Um, I think it's actually ownership, collective ownership. So I think we cannot, we're not doing ourselves a service by avoiding the term ownership when it comes to data. I'm, I'm against the individual monetization of ownership or individual property rights to data. But I think we need a kind of collective ownership of data, even to the extent that it's a collective property. That's, I, that's my personal answer to how we give it teeth, but it's, it's the um, answer. Okay, I just want to jump in with one, one of my two uh, points, uh, save the other for after new questions, because it's right on this. I just wanted to, to let you know, Barbara, um, or sort of ask you to have a look at the paper that I published in the Journal of Applied Philosophy with four comments where I argue for collective consent. The paper is called How Democracy Can Inform Consent. And so it addresses this issue of collectivizing control in terms of a notion of collective consent, which I don't develop enough, but it does suggest the role of say public utilities in relation to data, um, uh, uh, conceiving of, of uh, not just the internet, but the web along the lines of some sort of collective utility, uh, public utility. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that. I can send you the link afterwards. So let me proceed with, and um, I'll save my solidarity related questions for after some other interventions here. So Callum, you're next, another specialist on solidarity, if at the doctoral level. Thanks. Um, yeah, my question is pretty similar to Svenja's. Um, so just about those uh, distinctions that you drew between solidarity and justice. Uh, again, it struck me that some of them worked better for some levels uh, than others. Uh, and the specific contrast I wanted to ask about was uh, the claim that 
the rules that are generated uh, by a principle of solidarity aren't held to the same sorts of standards of consistency that those generated by uh, uh, justice are. And I, again, it's I can see the motivation for that at the the sort of individual level. I think that was level one, if, if I remember the, the levels right. Um, uh, you know, perhaps I, I've got some sort of special connection with uh, political movement on the other side of the world and I stand in solidarity with them and I don't stand in solidarity with a comparable group in a different country with which I don't have a connection and that's all fine. Like I'm not uh, uh, criticizable for, for not showing sort of equal concern for each. Um, but at the institutional level, it seems like there would be a lot of avenues for that sort of criticism, right? If a, if a government had some sort of uh, solidarity based welfare provision system, but was systematically giving preferential treatment through that system to some groups over others, then it seems like we would want to criticize them precisely for failing to show solidarity in a sort of um, sort of consistent way across across different groups. So again, it, it, it seemed to me like that contrast might work at, at, at one level, but I didn't quite see whether it worked uh, at the other. Is that? Thanks. Um, I have, thank you. I've got a very short answer for you. You're right. So you're right. I mean, we we need to say that um, actually, as, as soon as solidarity has solidified or is instantiated in contractual and and other legal norms, then justice has bearing on it anyhow, because then the consistent application of rules emerges from the fact that it is now binding law, to which justice considerations apply as enshrined in the constitution and equality and so on. So in, in that sense, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll note that down. Mm, well, Callum, did you want to come back? Uh, because her answer is really that it's somehow that justice is what's making the difference at those institutional levels. Whereas I think you were arguing that solidarity itself requires consistency. So which is it? Uh, were you arguing that? And if so, I don't see how Barbara can really agree with you. Oh, okay, you're right. Then if that's what you meant, Callum, then- Well, I don't know, I'm asking Callum, so. So the, the basic thought I had was that we might want to say some institutional, uh, uh, some sort of social institutions like welfare provision or healthcare uh, systems, they are not only enacting principles of justice, but we might also want to say something like they're enacting principles of solidarity. Um, and it does seem like we can uh, criticize those systems for failing to be consistent um, in the way that they target different groups, say, right? Uh, now, it's clear that um, if the grounds on which we're doing that are all based on justice, then I, I feel like you're off the hook, so to speak, with, with that contrast that you were drawing. Um, uh, and so I guess the issue is whether or not we can say that. Perhaps the way to, to get you off the hook is to say something like, um, look, solidar solidarity requires that we treat at least some groups <laughs> with this sort of uh, treatment. And then the justice requirement kicks in and says, well, if you treat any group in this sort of way, then you also have to treat others as a requirement of justice. So if if, if it's just justice that's doing the, the legwork of bringing the consistency requirements into play, um, uh, then I, I feel like your contrast works even at the institutional level. Um, I, yeah, I, I feel like I'm, I'm not in a position yet to mount an argument, but there's part of me <laughs> that wants to say that perhaps even if we think about the principle of solidarity itself and what that requires, it may well um, 
have its own sort of consistency requirements, but I, I, I'm not going to try to uh, spell out exactly. Well, I want to try. Uh, okay. <laughs> <I'm provoked laughs> I'll hand something. over to someone else. Sorry, Matthew, I'll get to you in a second. Um, I mean, it's a question whether you want to have a critical conception of all of these norms or not. And so I think that a, a critical conception of solidarity is really drawn from a different tradition than the one that you're highlighting. And it's drawn from the social movement um, tradition, uh, labor solidarity, especially, uh, that itself is intrinsically aimed at justice. So that's my view, as you know, I see a relationship, I, I define solidarity non-neutrally, um, uh, not just for normative reasons, but also to do justice <laughs> to the, uh, so to speak, to the various movements that have put solidarity on the agenda. I think your view comes more from the unitary conceptions of solidarity. Uh, those, what I call unitary versus what I call networking conceptions, where the unitary ones understand each person within a given unity as standing in the same relation to the others as members. And that's like the Three Musketeers is the highlight, uh, is the iconic representation, one for all and all for one, and then it's applied to nation states. And um, I think it has validity, but I know you're trying for a cross-cutting definition, but I think that the other one uh, builds, uh, builds uh, an orientation to justice into it. So it's partly a question of choice, but I wanna say about justice also that I think, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about ideal and non-ideal. I don't feel that those terms are really fully adequate, but the conception of justice that you're operating with is very thin as well and is not rooted in social practices at all. Whereas it could be argued that there's a more intrinsic relation. So I see solidarity as building justice on the ground as it were, as a kind of constructivist uh, notion um, where it's an, uh, based on these relationships we, we um, you know, that are to some degree pro-social and so forth, we build justice on the ground. So I just wanted to present that there is this alternative view um, that I think um, it's more normative than yours. But about the neutral one, even if you remain within the neutral one, I guess I would differ about the terrorist groups being exemplars of solidarity. Um, because for one thing, they tend to be hierarchical. And especially a lot of, of gangs and a lot of uh, white supremacist groups, once you're in, you can't get out. Uh, and moreover, they are hierarchical within their operation. They tend to have leaders and followers. Uh, and I think that it's a little bit too um, oversimplified to just look at them and say somehow that there's solidarity because it doesn't even measure up to your own requirements, it would seem to me. And this form of, of reciprocity, as Callum pointed out in a recent comment to my paper uh, correctly, is that it's often instrumental or it's sometimes instrumental and tit for tat rather than um, the kind of intrinsic mutuality and the whole idea of mutual aid, which is very central to the social movement's conception of solidarity is missing. Uh, it might be on some dimensions, you know, in the sense that they're willing to die for the group, but in many other ways, it, it may be missing. So I just wanted to pose that as, a, as another issue with, with the account. That's a lot of different questions, but um, um, I'm with the other side of justice, solidarity. I think they're very intricately related, much closer than in your thin reading of both of them. So I'll just pick one or two things, Carol, because um, I know that there's also one, at least one other comment. Yeah, yeah, I want to get but to Matthew. With, with regard to the terrorist group, I'm, I'm happy that you say that because um, th that in a way, I know that this was not your intention, but th that in a way um, exonerates us from, from, from speaking uh, to solidarity within these groups. This is an example that um, was put to us as critique. It, it was not my claim that terrorist groups have um, high levels of solidarity. It's conceivable, but I personally very much agree that 
it's probably or my impression is that's more often not the case than it is the case. Um, with regard to um, the unitary versus networked um, understanding of solidarity here, I uh, disagree with your reading of our account because the social movement account is actually one that gave, you know, in, in the development of our working definition, that's, that's exactly the one that I had in mind with the uh, um, workers' movement that said, despite all the differences that might exist between us, that's the one thing that, that, that binds us all together. And that's the one thing that creates this moral obligation almost, or this, this opportunity also for mutual support that then becomes institutionalized. So that from, for us was the paradigmatic example to think about the different levels of solidarity. However, I think to say that that is, um, that is then also justice is sort of well, aims at justice, justice. intrinsically aims at justice in the form of mutuality. I think the only the, the, the only difference that I see that I wouldn't say intrinsically in the in the case of workers' movements, yes, but we have. I have a broader definition of what solidarity could be, whether it deserves to be called thin is a matter of perspective, but it's certainly broader. I wouldn't say intrinsically. And that's the one word I think where we differ. Which so what be about justice? What about the thinness of your account of justice and its relation to practice? Do you, I mean, it does seem as though you're talking about justice as some kind of merely a rigorous, uh, you know, balancing uh, or something like that, a rigorous evaluation of equality or sameness or, I mean, I think the conception of justice also comes, is has some practical elements to it that would need to be reflected on. Yes, so I, I totally agree that this was a, 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 a very limited glimpse into some elements of justice that I think and we can distill from the broad variety of conceptualizations of justice that help me understand how justice is different from solidarity. But there is, as I ho hope I said, I think I said, there's, there's definitely also conceptualizations of justice that see it very much as a relational and a practice term. But the difference in my mind is that justice always is also the subject of um, debate about what it's um, what its content is in the abstract, which solidarity is not to the same extent. So I think that solidarity requires this explicit link to a substantive value, typically justice, but it doesn't, it doesn't emerge from solidarity in itself automatically. I think this is where we disagree. Okay, thank you. Matthew. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, a little bit following Sean's question, because I like the way you said that like solidarity is often toothless. I was wondering if you could speak to the way that informing this solidarity we might, because it's a perennial concern for me, how we might be able to resist like Facebook or Google's data governance or maybe misgovernance. Uh, that's that's a huge, hugely important, but also a huge question, Matthew. Um, I mean, I'm inclined to ask you what you think. I, I, I think, because I want to learn from this, I think that we should not, we as a society, and I mean a world society, not a particular nation state, should not accept um, that large entities that are not um, that, 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 that are not accountable to the public that are not that don't, don't have any kind of democratic legitimation um, have that much that, that are such a concentration of power and resources as they are. So I I would be inclined to say um, you know, Let's not have those entities. Let's let's have laws that that disallow, that forbid such concentrations of power and resources. 
and let's make sure that we have publicly owned infrastructures, in this case, platforms that that fulfill those roles. If we accept these roles, communication and so on as, as basic infrastructure or even a basic service, as some people argue, then I think it should be publicly owned and it should be publicly accountable. So that would be my answer. What's your answer? I have like, like looking at the individual cases of it, I thought of like different things. I like, well, maybe this would work that ultimately fall a little bit ridiculous because even part of resisting it, I think, means being already plugged into it in some way, like having that interaction with it. So I don't know what I could do here that really helps somebody in another part of the world where they don't have like internet access or they're not being like encompassed by this yet. So they're still going to be vulnerable when it happens, whatever I do now, unless something that happens in this part of the world like really hinders that development, which I think there's a double effect doctrine there. Like there are good things to the internet that help us. So I don't know if we should do that, but I also sort of following that, like you said, like towards common ownership, I was wondering if you're familiar with uh, Mackenzie Wark's sort of like weird thought experiment that separates this from capitalism as its own mode of production. Yeah, so I, I think these are, these are, these are much more, even more fundamental ways of, uh, of, of addressing the problem because they, they question and challenge and scrutinize not only the way that we govern data once they're there, but even the, you know, the curation and collection of data. So they are ultimately ask the question, should we datafy at all? Um, and I think that these, these are, are very, very fruitful ways of thinking about it. So anything that increases and strengthens um, collective control, not over data only, as you, I think, rightly pointed out, if I understood you correctly, once they're there, but even ways of deciding what we create, what we datafy, what we don't datafy, which ultimately speaks to the core of, of what privacy means, um, the more collective control and ownership we have of those questions, the better. And But that's a quite, quite radical challenge to to uh, capitalist uh, structures, as, as you say. So I think what, what we do in this line of work is much more modest in that we say, um, let's, let's try to increase collective control over, over data once they're there. But I just, just yeah? want to add that it's possible to retain the, um, the network worked aspect of, of the computer networking that was designed really to have no centralized nodes. It's possible to do that at the same time as enhancing certain degrees of collective control if it isn't owned by corporations. If the, um, there is a way to implement this similar to the way the internet was designed so that it would be open uh, and not centralized. And it was designed by scientists originally who had that those norms in view which seemed to me they were then it then became commercialized and it's virtually destroyed th those norms but those norms are consistent with uh some elements of collective control so i think it's not enough to just talk about the collective control part because you certainly don't want big government control over our information either so it, i think it has to be both things at the same time, and they are consistent with each other. You could have a similar, and in fact, Berners-Lee is working on a second web. You know, he's pretty old by now, but um, he's working on a, another web that would not require advertising. And uh, in addition, there are proposals that it could be done. You could have social media platforms that are operate in this decentralized way, in a way analogous to the basic internet itself. 
And it's just with this overlay of advertising and the big corporations that have led it in very commercialized ways. But I think, I think a, a notion of central control could be supplemented with this des desirability of a decentralized format to yeah, allow right. for really individual outreaches to other individuals. I mean, email operates that way, but it could also work for social media, supposedly. There's a uh, an argument along these lines in a paper I read, I'll have to find it again, um, in one of the progressive journals, one of the few <laughs> out there. Um, it wasn't Jacobin, it was somewhere else, I'll find it. Thank you very much. I think this is a very important point. Yes. I mean, I don't know exactly what it would look like and work would need to be done, but you want to preserve that openness and the ability of individuals to link up with other individuals, provided it's just not at, you know, at costs of harm and so forth. So, okay. Well, any other questions? I think we've reached the limit of our time. And I, oh, Hugo, well, short. I, I can't resist adding a, another aspect to this, which is, yes, there's a corporate control of data, but there's a big problem coming when it comes to collective references. I've read an article recently that was pretty frightening, it was sent to me by the Dean of the NYU Bopes Library, a study of about 30,000 professional papers including dissertations and peer-to-peer -peer organized journals like in JSTOR or Elsevier, where about 30 to 40% of the reference links in bibliographies lead to dead ends now. They <laughs> are not being maintained by anybody in particular. And so is there a social responsibility so that when you create a reference in a professional paper that the reference stays put so that other people can peer review your articles. There are social responsibilities that are handed off to the internet that perhaps should be pushed down to an individual, but I'm not sure how that can actually happen. Hmm. Thank you for, I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. It's really, oh. um, it's, okay. it's, fri it's frightening. It's yeah. 30% gone, lead nowhere, 404 blue screen, not found. Yeah, I like your I Leviathan uh, notion in that <laughs> sense. It's, it's yeah. uh, monstrous, some of the things that go on. Okay, anyway, um, well, we've done with fighting monsters here, and we'll need a more solidarity, right, Barbara? Um, we can agree on that. So of uh, the good kind, anyway, whether it's through the admixture of justice or intrinsically related to it. So thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Please join me in thanking Barbara. Yay. Thank you very much for your very, really, very- Really, nice. really interesting. You're such an expert. It was wonderful to have it all laid out so clearly and uh, gives us a lot to think about, both about solidarity and about data governance. So really appreciate it, Barbara. It was terrific.